Welcome back to another video uh, lesson for exponential functions for AP Calculus AB. Uh, this again should all be review material. Um, these are some of the prerequisite skills that you're going to need to be successful later on when we start getting into some of those calculus concepts. So let's talk a little bit about what an exponential function is uh, by relating it first to something that we should be very comfortable with and that's a linear function. Now a linear function describes uh, something that is growing at a constant rate and that rate we learned earlier on is called the slope of that line. Now um, exponential growth uh, involves a different kind of growth. So instead of growing at a constant rate, um, an exponential growth problem means that we are growing by some multiplicative value. So each time we're doubling or we're tripling or sometimes we can be decreasing. Um, you can have a decreasing linear function. You can have a decreasing exponential function and you'll find that it decreases by dividing by a number or really what's happening is we're multiplying by a value that is between 0 and 1. So exponential growth is just a little bit different. Um, and the classic algebra problem that you may have seen is, um, you know, we always start out by introducing this concept by saying, would you rather earn $5 a day for a month um, or start with a dollar and double your money? So, you know, you've got this linear function. It would end up being y equals 5x. So you're getting $5 per day. You're adding on when you look at the table of values. $5, so you go 5, 10, 15. Well, with, you, with an exponential um, problem, if you start with $1, your table doubles each day. So you have $1, the next day you have 2, the next day you have 4, the next day you have 8. And in the beginning, that linear function will have higher y values. But there's going to come a point in time when that exponential function, it does meet the linear function, but then it takes off and it just explodes with its y values. And the growth just becomes so much faster um, and the y value is so much um, higher. And so at the end of 30 days, that exponential function is going to exceed the linear function um, by massive quantities. And so you definitely should take that deal. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what an exponential function would look like. So if you have a graphing calculator, um, go ahead and get it out. Uh, we're going to review some things that you need to know uh, in your graphing calculator, like how to solve and the buttons that you need to push. Um, so now would be a great time to practice those. And you might think to yourself, well, I already know how to do exponential functions. And I think that's great. But you might be a little bit rusty on using your calculator to solve them. So we're going to review some of those things um, along the way. So if you don't have your calculator, go ahead and pause it and uh, run and go get it. And uh, I'm going to get mine out so that we can use it and uh, do some practice problems. So here we have our first example. Um, and you can go ahead and take a moment. And we're going to type this into our graphing calculator and graph it. Now, um, to get to my graphing calculator, I'm going to hit my y equals button. And this is where I'm going to enter that equation. So let's see. I'll put it right up over here so we can see. So I'm going to have 2. I'm going to enter it exactly as I see it, 3. And actually, I'm going to put the uh, exponent to the outside. I prefer to do it that way just because if I ever have a negative value in there, sometimes that happens, I want to make sure that I'm raising the entire quantity to that exponent of x. Now, uh, I'm going to hit my zoom 6 button, and that gives me my standard viewing window. And so your window should match what we see over here. And so what we want to do now is uh, we want to take uh, and identify some key features. So first things first, let's identify the y-intercept. Now, the y-intercept of a function is where my graph is going to cross the y-axis. And one of the things that we need to remember is that at a y-intercept, um, the value of x at the y-intercept is always going to be 0. So what I'm going to do is if x is equal to 0, I'm going to take the equation. And the easiest thing to do is just to say y equals 2 times 3 to the 0 minus 4. Anything to the 0 power is just 1. So this is 2 minus 4, or negative 2. And on the graph, it should look like that, and it does. So now let's identify this thing called the horizontal asymptote. Now, one of the things that I hate is that uh, sometimes in math class, your teacher might tell you that an asymptote is a, an invisible barrier that your equation will never touch or cross. And while this holds true for a lot of basic functions, we're going to see later on that a horizontal asymptote technically uh, the horizontal kind, um, really what they are is it's, it's a limitation of a function. So what we're looking at is the end behavior. And when I say end behavior, what I'm talking about is as x approaches either positive infinity on the right side, so you're plugging in ginormous numbers, getting closer and closer to positive infinity. And then on the left side, when we plug in ginormous numbers like negative a million or something like that, or even bigger as we approach those negative infinity values. 
what's happening on either end. And what happens is uh, you have a horizontal asymptote is if on either side, uh, as you consider those values, if your y value tends towards one value, then that value is what we define as the horizontal asymptote. And we're going to actually learn in chapter two that the official definition of a horizontal asymptote is a function where on one end or the other, it could be both, and you could have multiple horizontal asymptotes, but if on one side or another, your y values are approaching a set hard number as x approaches an infinity, either positive or negative, that's the definition of a horizontal asymptote. And uh, it's actually called a limit, and we're going to learn that in Unit 2 and really give it some more mathematical notation. But that's the concept that we're going to get into. So on the left side, we can kind of see that, yes, this graph seems to be approaching a value. Now, what value it's approaching, we can tell by looking at the table. So what I'm going to do here is in my graphing calculator is I'm going to go to my table. Now, my table is defaulted to show me values um, that are maybe around zero or uh, something like that. But I'm going to show you how you can jump to a later spot in your table. And you can do this by hitting second, and then the window button takes you to your table settings. Now here you can change your table to start wherever you wanted, and you can see that I already had mine starting at negative 106. Most of us have it set to start at zero. That's kind of the default. So what I would encourage you to do is take this value, and we're going to go ahead and just plug in a really big number. Um, negative 100 is probably sufficient. Um, and then this little delta table, remember we talked about that triangle meaning the change in, that's what you want to count by. So if you ever want your table to count by something else, let's say you have a trig function and you'd like to count by pi over 2, you can change it to count by pi over 2 by typing that in there to the delta table. You can also count by point ones if you have really small numbers. So you can adjust your table to show you anything that you needed to show you. So now I'm going to go back to the table, second graph. And you'll see that my y values are becoming negative 4. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the trickery and, and what's happening here uh, with my table. And you'll see it says y is negative 4, but it's not actually ever equal to negative 4. And here's why. Your calculator is very limited in what it can show you. And it is set to round to a certain uh, number of digits. And there comes a point when it just doesn't have room, so it just rounds it to negative 4. And it says, nah, good enough. Technically, it's never going to equal negative 4, and here's why. When you have a y value of negative 4, let's see, 2 times 3 to the x minus 4. If I try to solve that, I get 0 equals 2 times 3 to the x. Divide by 2, you get 0 equals 3 to the x. This would have to equal 0. And if you think about the way exponents work, you know, 3 to the 1 is 3, 3 to the 2 is 9, it'll get bigger, but if we put in negative exponents, remember like 3 to the negative 1, and you can try this in your calculator, is just 1 third. It's 0.3, and 3 to the negative 2 is 1 ninth. So the bigger you get on that negative side, bigger, the further away from 0 you get on the negative side, um, the smaller your number gets, and it approaches 0, but it never actually gets there. And so you'll never actually equal negative 4, even though your calculator makes it seem that way. So we're approaching that negative 4 value, and y equals negative 4 is the equation of that horizontal asymptote. You might also remember that uh, in the general basic form here of the uh, equation, it would be that number that's added or subtracted onto the end, generally speaking. But it's not always going to look like that, so the better way to think about it is, what is my graph approaching as I'm going to the left or as I'm going to the right towards one of those infinities? The x-intercept is uh, what we get where we're crossing the uh, x-axis, and we actually can't find that uh, on my graph uh, easily. We could solve for it algebraically, and we're going to get there. But let me show you how you'd find it in your calculator, just so we can walk through that. On my graph, I'm going to go second trace, and I'm going to try to find what's called the zero. That's another word for my x-intercept. It's where I cross the x-axis. It's where... Um, my y becomes 0, because remember, I'm solving for the equation 0 equals, and then the equation. So I'm going to solve for a 0, and then it's going to show my graph, and it's going to say, oh, I need a left bound. So I need to take this blinky cursor, and uh, if you don't have the color screen, you can just make sure you're paying attention. Make it to the left of where it's crossing the x-axis and hit enter. Then it's going to ask for a right bound, so you're going to arrow over to the right and be on the right side. Hit enter, and then you're going to come back to the middle, and once a guess, the closer you get, the faster your calculator will spit that answer out, and 0.631, or 0.6309275.
So point six three zero nine two. I'm going to stop right there. Um, now here's a little AP pro tip, and I didn't write it down, and I probably should have. Oh, I did write it down. Oh no, I didn't. <laughs> um, I saw the word three. Here's your AP pro tip. Uh, you need to always round your decimal places to at least three places. Uh, you cannot go to 0.63. You have to include three values. So the x-intercept here, you can round it to 0.630 or 0.631. Now, you might say to yourself, 0.630 is not rounded, and you would be correct. We call this the truncated version. So this is called truncating, and this one is the rounded one. But three places is the AP exam standard. And I have actually graded the AP exam, and I have had to take points away from students who do not round to three places. And I do it on my tests, and I will do it to you so that you can feel the pain here and now and not lose credit on an AP exam. So um, make sure that you're always rounding to at least three places. You can go beyond three, and it's totally fine as long as they are correct. Uh, if they're not correct, then... Then it, then it becomes a little dicey. But three places is always a good, play, uh, good, good rule of thumb. And actually, I take that back. Even if uh, beyond, the first three have to be right. After that, even if there's some rounding issues, uh, it's not that big of a deal. But three places is your uh, minimum acceptable amount. Now, will an exponential function always have all three of these features? So if we think about this, an exponential function will generally always look like this, or sometimes it'll be decreasing in that same way. But we can shift them, and you should have talked about this in a pre-calculus class somewhere along the way. You can shift those graphs up and down. And so if we think about shifting this particular graph, what if we, ex what if we sh had an equation that was up here? Would it still have a horizontal asymptote? Yes. Would it still have a y-intercept? Yes. But does it have an x-intercept? And the answer here is no. So not necessarily, not always, because you could uh, shift that x-intercept, or you could shift up and you would um, lose the x-intercept because of the asymptote. So it is possible that you would um, lose one of those. So let's take a look now at uh, what happens when we graph a second function in here and uh, what that's going to look like. So take a moment, and uh, without erasing the other function that we just did, in your calculator, go ahead and put this new function. So if I hit graph, I should see what's on the screen. And uh, we want to review now a little bit about uh, how would you find the intersection point of these two equations? How would you solve the equation um, that looks like this? Uh, y1 equals y2. So how could you find that intersection point? So let's review a little bit of what we would do in our calculator. So again, there's the equation that we're uh, trying to solve for. Let's keep that on the screen. If I go to second trace, that's the calculate menu, now I'm going to choose option number five, and that's going to find the intersection of these two points. So option five, and then it says, hey, what's the first curve? And as long as you only have two curves in there, this part's easy. You just hit enter. It says, hey, what's the second curve? Then you hit enter. It automatically jumps to it for you, and then it wants a guess. And remember, the closer you get to the guess, the faster your calculator will spit it out. So here my intersection is 1.05. Five, I'll round it to three places, and 2.371. So 1.055 and 2.371. So if that's the intersection point, then the x-coordinate is the solution. 1.055 is the answer that I am looking for, because remember, I'm solving for x. Now, I could solve this algebraically, and we're going to talk about that. And you always need to be ready to solve things with and without a calculator. Because typically on the AP exam, there's two parts of it. Um, actually, there's four parts. But two of the parts are calculator-based, and two of the parts are not calculator-based. And so um, you have to be able to solve these things with and without a calculator. So be thinking as you do uh, practice problems and as you watch these videos, how could I approach this problem with the calculator, and how could I approach it without? Some problems you cannot approach without a calculator. Um, so that'll happen from time to time. But for the most part, you need to be thinking about, well, how would I approach this if I didn't have a calculator? How would I approach it if I did? Because um, if you have a calculator available, you're expected to use it. So let's talk a little bit more about some uh, other exponential formulas that we want to know. We've got some general equations um, that are 
who are going to pop up from time to time that should be familiar. And uh, you need to know these and uh, be ready to at least plug things into them. So the first one is your general growth or decay. So this is like a population that's increasing, bacteria that are doubling, or a basic investing money and having a certain percentage rate. So whatever Y is, this is always going to be your new amount. Whatever P is, that's always going to be your beginning amount. R is always going to be a percentage rate. So that's your percent of growth or your percent increase. And if you have like 3%, that needs to be changed to a decimal before you can use it in the equation. And last but not least, T is always going to represent the time interval that we are um, you know, having this exponential growth or decay. Um, we also have some other formulas. Uh, this one has all the same letters as uh, the one in number one, but it has this new N. And N uh, refers to uh, the number of times that we're going to compound something. Usually we talk about it in terms of interest, but there are other applications where um, we could be growing over the span of a year and then um, compounding something um, every month or something like that. And what that means is if I uh, invest money into an account and um, the account has a 3% interest rate, which is insane by the way, um, what would happen is at the end of month one, you would take 3% of whatever's in the account add that on, and then in month two, when you calculate the um, percentage rate to add on, um, what you're doing is you're taking whatever interest you got in month one and calculating interest on your interest. So you're calculating interest on interest, and then in month three, you're calculating interest on the interest from month two that was compounded from month one. So compounding just means it just keeps getting bigger. And we like this. Compound interest is a good thing for the person earning it. Um, so when I talk about the number of times we compound, if it's compounded monthly within a year, then N would be 12 because there are 12 months. So our last formula is this uh, continuously compounded. And what this means is you're compounded an infinite number of times. So to be continuously compounded, it's like saying that N would be like an infinity. So let's think about this. If we had P times 1 plus R over infinity, this is really weird, to the infinity times t power. Well, that's just going to be an infinity, right? And r is so tiny. I mean, gosh. So what happens is, you know, you have this thing. And as the n approaches infinity, you start to get an expression that looks like this. Oh. And um, what happens is, this value actually approaches a number. It has what we call a limit. As n approaches an infinity, the limit turns out to be a number that starts out as uh, 2.718. And um, this is, uh, it's, we represent it with the letter E. This is Euler's number. Um, it's also called the natural number because it appears in a lot of um, relationships that we see in, uh, in nature. And um, this number is a pretty amazing thing. So when we have p times you know, 1 to the rt, there's some mathematics involved in how the r becomes a part of the uh, um, exponent. But essentially, that's where the e comes from. Compounded continuously means we're compounding an infinite number of times within our time period. So that's why this parenthesis here kind of turns into an e. Um, it's because of that limit and, and the way that expression works. So our PERT formula is going to show up, and uh, we're just going to practice kind of using it a little bit. Um, but one thing that I want you to understand is that if ever we have e to a power, um, e to a power is always positive. It is never going to be zero, and it's always increasing. So knowing these things is going to be helpful later on, especially when we get into chapter four, and uh, we're going to have some e to the x floating around in some of our equations. And remembering these things makes life easy. So let's just kind of practice. We're going to do uh, a couple things here, solving uh, both algebraically and graphically. Um, so let's set up a few equations. You want to invest your savings into one account. Now, we don't know how much our savings are, uh, but we know we can invest in, a, in an account that compounds your interest monthly at a rate of 2.3%, which in my equation, I'm going to make sure that I use 0 .2, uh, 0 0.023, and then 0.021%, or sorry, 2.1%, or 0.021, this account will compound continuously. So that's my PERT formula. So let's go ahead and write our equations out. 
So now we don't know an amount. So when we don't know an amount, um, we want to just use an amount that's easy. So let's say we're going to invest $1. That's a nice, easy thing. Um, so here we go. $1, or uh, sometimes you might use 100% of a, an amount. That would be another uh, way to think about it. And change it to a 1 because uh, 1 is a nice, easy number, and you can't use a percent in a formula. So our new amount then would be 2. 1 and then 1 plus 0 0.023 it's compounded monthly so n is 12 and then 12t so there's one equation that we're going to have to solve the other equation that we're going to solve is y 2 equals 1 times e to the 0.021t so I'm going to solve both of these in two different ways. I'm going to solve one graphically and one algebraically. So let's do the graphical one first. The first thing I'm going to want to do is to get my calculator out, and uh, I, want to, I want to clear some things out of there. So when I solve an equation, the left side of my equation, which here is the number 2, is going to go into one of my y equals, and the right side of the equation is going to go into the other uh, y equals equation. Now you'll notice here I use the letter X instead of T, and that's totally okay. And when I hit the graph button, it takes a couple minutes for it to graph on the screen, but initially my screen looks like this. So that tells me that I need to play around with my window. Now I need to think about what's going on with my graph, and as I adjust my window, my X min and my X max, I know that I'm solving for um, a time value. So my X minimum, um, I can maybe leave that as zero in this case, because I suspect that it's on the far right side of my screen. Now, I'm measuring the number of years it takes to double, so that could be a lot. So I'm just going to go ahead and just say, uh, let's look at 50 years and see what that gives me. And it might work out and it might not, and I might have to come back and adjust. But I need to be able to see where that intersection point is. Now my Y min and my Y max, I know that I'm only going to go up to 2. So my Y min, I'm going to go ahead and make that 0, and I'm going to make my Y max 3. I'm going to go slightly above where I'm going to be. And then if I hit graph, it'll go ahead and re-graph these things for me, and hopefully I'll be able to see where the two functions can intersect. Once I can see the intersection, that's when I'm going to use my second trace button to find the intersection point. So let's go ahead and do that now. So second, trace, and I'm going to find an intersection. So blue line, enter. Red line, enter, set first curve, second curve. What are the two curves? And as long as you only have two in there, you're in good shape. You don't need to worry too much about this. And then remember, the closer you get to that guess, the faster it is that your calculator spits it out. And look at that. Y is 2, right? So that's your uh, doubling after 30.166 years. So we're going to say 30.166 years. Now, the other one, um, I'm going to solve algebraically because we need to review those algebra steps because remember, what do we do with a calculator? What do we do without a calculator? So to solve this, I'm going to remember that when I have an exponential function, the way that I solve an exponential function is using a logarithm. And we're going to get more into that in the next video. But for now, I want you to remember, and I hope that you do, that if you just take the natural log of both sides, we have this property that says when you take the natural log of an exponential function, so there's my exponent circled, the exponent can be moved to the front and it turns into a coefficient. So as long as I take the log of both sides, I'm not breaking any rules here. So I get this, 0 0.021t times the natural log of e. Well, the natural log of e, if you don't remember, is just 1. And the reason why, um, the reason why that is is because when I am thinking about natural logs, log base b of b equals question mark. What this is saying is b to what power makes b? Well, the question mark will always be 1. And natural log is log base e. So log base e of e just means e to what power makes e? Oh, 1. So that's why it evaluates out to 1. So then all I have to do is divide out that 0.021, and I get that for this answer, t is the natural log of 2 divided by 0 0.021. And we can evaluate that in our calculator fairly easily and figure out what it is. Here's my natural log button, natural log of 2, close my parentheses, divided by 0 0.021, and we find that it's 33 years. So it actually takes a little bit longer for the compound interest that is compounded um, continuously 
than it does for the other one. Oftentimes the continuous, if, they're, uh, if the same conditions are present, the continuous one is always better. But this one, they didn't have the exact same rate, so they were trying to fool you. So let's keep on going. Um, and just as a side note, you don't have to plug it into your calculator. That circled answer right there is in exact form, and that's completely 100% acceptable on tests and also on uh, AP exams, unless otherwise stated. Let's review a few uh, exponent rules. Um, sometimes we need to think of expon exponential functions in a different way. So um, this will be kind of where we leave things and where we close out, but these are the rules for exponents that hopefully you've seen before. Um, we have like bases. When we have like bases, we add the exponents. When we have like bases that are being divided, sorry, in the first one it was like bases being multiplied. Here we have like bases being divided, and when we divide like bases, we subtract those exponents, and it's the numerator exponent minus the denominator exponent. Um, number three says when we have a base raised to two powers, we multiply those powers. It's called a power to a power. Um, some of these just refer to being able to put the exponent into a product and, and onto a, um, a fraction that is all division. So let's talk a little bit about how we can rewrite some bases. So part A says we want to rewrite 4 squared as 2 to some power. So what I need to think about is, well, how can I express 2 or 4 as 2 to some power? Well, 4 is 2 squared. So I am going to rewrite this as 2 squared squared, and then I'm going to use that power to a power and realize that I can write this as 2 to the fourth power. So part B, I want to write this expression as 3 to some power. So I'm going to start out by writing 9 as 3 squared. That's my 9. And now I'm going to raise it to the 4x. And I'm going to use that same property and rewrite this as 3 to the 8x. Now part C is a little tricky because I have a fraction. So I need to remember a few things about how exponents work. So if I have 1 over 8, I can rewrite that as 1 over 2 cubed. So I have the 2 in there, but now I have the 2 on the bottom, and I want it to be at the top. So let's remember that if we have a value raised to an exponent in the bottom of a fraction, we can bring it to the top, provided that we turn that exponent negative. That's the notation. That's the language of mathematics that says a negative exponent means I need to take the reciprocal of whatever's there. So this becomes 2 to the negative 3 power. So I'm going to start out and I'm going to write 2 to the negative 3. That's the 1 8 that's in there. And that's then raised to the 3x. So this could be rewritten as 2 to the negative 9x. Now, last but certainly not least, find an equivalent form of b to the 2x plus 1. Well, we've actually got a couple different answers that we can pick from. So one example would be to look up here at rule number one that says when we had like bases that were being added or being multiplied, the exponents got added. So one way we could express this is we could say, well, it's just b to the 2x times b to the 1, right? That we had like bases and they got added. We could also think of it as um, b squared to the x power times b. We could also write it as b to the x squared times b. And there's probably other ways that we could express this, uh, but basically we need to get comfortable with understanding um, that we can manipulate exponents, provided that we follow these rules, to make uh, expressions that maybe are going to be a little easier to deal with when we get it to the complex calculus. So I hope this has been a, a good review of exponential functions and um, the things that you need to be able to do with them. And I hope you're feeling a little more comfortable. And again, as always, my encouragement to you is to keep on going uh, because you can do this. You've got it.